um, buy their first NFT artworks and start creating their own. But I think the future is really bright. There will be many people interacting and I am looking forward for a lot of cool projects coming up. Leandro is asking if uh, you enjoy burning tokens. <laughs> I have burned tokens uh, accidentally, but uh, you can't compare that to burning things in real life. It's not uh, that much fun. And burning my own tokens, no. Uh, I think I sent two or three to other people's just uh, for like the one I sent to Dan or uh, another one with the middle finger to someone who uh, said that these tokens are crappy. I considered that one burned because I never got the reply. So I don't know if the person appreciates my token, but yeah, might be lost. I don't know. Leandro is also asking, do you think having the artwork full on chain is an important thing for NFT collectors and artists? Yeah, for some collectors, it's it seems to be pretty important to have the whole the full data on chain because um, if now, for example, OpenSea uh, will die for whatever reason, um, my pictures are basically stored there locally. So then the the picture information would be lost, but I don't think that this will be the case. Um, there is a problem with storing all the data on chain because uh, I think e Ethereum network won't uh, appreciate um, being flooded by artists putting on shitloads of data and therefore, um, yeah, compromising the network. So one has to be very careful what to put on chain and whatnot. And I think uh, storing the pictures somewhere and just linking, linking there is uh, also a good way. To, to proceed. And then Russ, the last question, he is <laughs> asking, why did you start on that specific date? Um, what, uh, writing diary or, or tokenizing my, my scribbles in February? Which date uh, did, did this is meant there? You mean the 28th of August for starting my diary writing? I don't know, it was just, uh, was just some, I thought, yeah, why not? And I started then and I didn't stop. So yeah, that's the beginning. And the tokenizing started in February, um, was during one of the front meetups where we sat together. It was quite late and I think we were a bit uh, drunk already. And I just scribbled down some stuff and said, hey, why not? Can, can we please put that on chain? And yeah, so it, so it started. Then we, oh, we got another one from Lena. She says, uh, can you tell us about your crypto voxel builds? I noticed one of the P on the corner. Yeah, that's a, that's a funny story. Um, I'm uh, pretty lazy when it comes to building stuff in crypto voxels. And so I asked the community if someone was interested to build a museum for me and crypto boson uh, stood up and said he will do it. And he, he interpreted the term museum quite uh, interesting. He, he made a punk, uh, a punk hangout with some pictures on the wall and there's a, a lot of puke and pee and, and empty beer cans and punk songs and <clears throat> I have to admit I rather like that I think it's pretty funny it's a bit disgusting but yeah it's fun and then is the real real super final question from Russell if 32 by 32 pixel is a standard size for NFTs um, I think there will be NFTs with more pixels. Um, right now, that's the size we chose for the Crypto Vina and uh, also the Pixel Chain uh, project is using this uh, format, but I don't know if you could call it a standard. I think we'll, we will see a lot of development there and uh, also bigger file sizes on chain. So I suggest for other questions because there's still one more. There is the Q and A section, and uh, Julia, maybe you can just answer the questions by writing. And I like to continue with the next talk. It's from Corrado, and um, for me, it's amazing that due to this conference, we finally got in touch. Corrado is, in my humble opinion, one of the most skilled uh, blockchain developers, specialized on NXT, uh, and he created a social network prototype called Other Rocks but he also created like a, a fully working voting system and many, many other things on blockchain already just in his spare time. 
and uh, some other people would I don't know work <laughs> all what he's doing would do it in full time and and get get sponsorships and paid for it. But he's doing all this amazing work just just as a as a fan. And so I really like to. I'm really going to enjoy, I guess, and I'm sure the talk from Corrado when he's going to introduce especially the Other Rocks uh, project. Hello, my name is Corrado Andriani and I'm here to present you Other Rocks. A short introduction of myself, I am 45 years old. I am a telecommunication OSS engineer, which means I take care of monitoring systems for the mobile networks. And amongst many other hobbies, I really like the Ardor blockchain and the possibilities that it offers. So what is Ardor Rocks and what it tries to solve? Ardor Rocks is a WordPress plus BuddyPress uh, installation. It basically uh, gives social network capabilities to the site. And the problem of the current social networks is that there is no reward towards the people that create the content of the social network. The social networks do exist because people create content on these platforms, but the content creators actually do not get anything in return. Besides, they could use this to showcase their work or to promote themselves. But in terms of financial direct benefit, there is no benefit for who actually creates the content. In other rocks, we try to change that a bit. So here is how other rocks works in five essential steps. Basically the main step, the main let's say function of other rocks is that participation of the users is rewarded with the rocks token. Rocks is an asset created on, on Ardor. It can be traded, it can be sold, it can be um, transferred and this uh, asset is being transferred to the users that participate in order rock so users simply have to participate they contribute with their ideas they post a picture they um, comment they like etc etc each of these actions is rewarded with a certain amount of points these points are then converted into rocks Rocks are then um, um, earned by each, of you, each user and they can be uh, traded on the asset exchange. What happens then, what gives value to rocks is basically that rocks can be used to buy advertisement spaces on the website. So if a person is interested in, in adding an um, ad space on the website, they do need to pay for it with rocks. Therefore, they need to go on the asset exchange and buy some rocks to pay for the ad space. The rocks earned by the site administrator is used to maintain the platform and maybe make even a little profit. The profit, the rocks earned by the site administrator can then be put on the market again on the asset exchange and put them back in, um, in, in, um, in on sale on the market and they can be uh, acquired by the people that want to trade or that need them to buy for advertisement spaces. There are five points that I want to highlight and that build up, let's say, the idea around our rocks. One, is that content creators on social networks should be rewarded. Second is that BuddyPress and WordPress allow you to create the social networks with zero costs and with a few clicks. Therefore everybody can create a social network. Cryptocurrencies and blockchain are a fantastic layer on top of the internet that allow Microeconomies like Ardor Rocks want to achieve to exist purely in a digital world. Ardor in the space of cryptocurrencies and blockchain offers a very, very easy to use API 
and it's really really simple to use also for uh, a person like me that I'm not a native developer I just do this uh, very very in a very easy and basic way and yet I'm, I'm able to perform actions with the blockchains with the blockchain and now imagine if a platform like Ardo Rocks becomes popular besides the advertisement market it's easy to add some additional uh, market let's say uh, market related uh, functions like for example a marketplace where people can uh, put on sale uh, services or objects for and, and would pay fees in in rocks or sell the whole service or product for rocks and now let's go and have a look at the website the website appears like a very very standard uh, social network you have uh, a wall where people can post their um, their comments their pictures they can like and comment each other with each other they can build uh, friendships they can restrict access to information to friends they can create groups for specific needs if people do have a hobby in a specific uh, on, on something specific they can create a group and limit the access to the group etc etc the website also has a forum functionality and all these features are free to download and free to install so all what you see here is basically not developed by me this is a, a platform that one can every one of us can 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 download and install in the in the backend this is a standard wordpress backend as you see maybe who who is familiar with wordpress can recognize this very easily uh, the the let's say few components that allow other rocks to do what it does or wordpress of course bodypress we can see this it's in the list of installed plugins taking a second to appear so yes here we can see body press is the main component we do have then BB press that is the, the most popular forum plugin on top of uh, WordPress then we have another essential component still free to download and install is uh, MyCred. this is a very nice plugin to uh, re reward people with points so basically are the rocks hooks on this plugin to convert then the points into rocks so uh, this plugin is is very nice because every action on the website can be um, linked to a certain amount of points and there are plenty of, of options and someone could also create his customized uh, hook to um, reward points for specific actions another important plugin in this case this is a premium plugin is um, the ads plugin um, this allows us to uh, create a form on the front end where people can create their own ads and manage the existing ads, renew them, etc. So, how do we put this together with Ardor? Well, this is where I have created a little script that I will show you. This is a very, very simple uh, PHP script, it's a uh, hundred line of code more or less and all this does is to um, create a MySQL table where we track the points converted to rocks and paid and paid out we uh, 
uh, also with this script interact with the API of Ardor. We connect to a, a live node and we actually execute basically two simple API calls. Uh, the first one is to understand the uh, fee that we have to pay to transfer the asset, the rocks asset, and the second one is to actually transfer the rocks asset. So this is uh, possible on the other blockchain because we do have um, uh, bundlers. Um, the bundler concept means that um, we can pay fees in the child chain, uh, let's say, currency. So the difference between, for instance, Ethereum and Ardor is that in Ardor, the main chain is Ardor and everything on top of it, uh, every child chain like Ignis or um, MPG, etc., can have transaction paid in the child chain um, token. In this case, we have ROX is an asset built on Ignis and therefore we pay fees in Ignis to transfer the asset from one user to the other. So instead of paying fees in Ardor, which is the parent chain, we pay fees in Ignis. And these fees are open to the market and therefore the bundlers that compete to each other and they have a different rate. So in order to pay a fee in Ignis, we first have to understand which rate applies and then we do the actual transfer with the current rate. In that case, the, the best rate on the market. So this is essentially our the rocks. It is a very, very easy and free to do to build platform with this unique, let's say, element, which is the connection between the website and the Ardor blockchain, where we actually convert points into um, assets. This is uh, very simple as you, as, you have, uh, as you have seen, it's a 100 lines code and this the next step will be to pack this in a WordPress plugin. This means that everyone with a WordPress and BodyPress installation they can download the plugin and they will be able to uh, distribute their own assets they will create on the asset on the asset exchanger Ardor and allow their users to get rewarded and to create a micro economy on their website. So that's all for Ardor Rocks. I hope you enjoyed this time and I hope to see you soon on Ardor Rocks. Thank you. What do you think of the shit? It's still Hello? Hello, can you hear me? I can certainly hear you. Ah, okay. Sorry for the last comment. That was not meant to be there. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, basically I've, um, I, I've um, started actually to develop this uh, plugin and uh, it's pretty much on the way to be uh, finished. So it's very simple. It's a very, very simple uh, um, script. And one thing I forgot to mention in the script is that the payments to the users happen uh, in, um, let's say, uh, four times a day. So not too often because then that might uh, let's say be tricky to manage uh, cheats or um, if someone wants to game the system uh, so in that way more or less at uh, four times a day um, and let's say shift it slightly one could manage those a bit better so if you have any question Colorado, most people that created uh, social media platforms on blockchain Basically, they started in ICO to try to get funding from other sources. Some of them collected millions and all those networks, well, most of them are no longer existing. And maybe even the frauded people, that's something new.
cannot say out loud, but it seems so. Why are you just, just making all these things happen as a private person who has fun uh, playing around with tools? And this is something that I learned that you were just playing around with existing tools and then you try to find a way to connect it with blockchain and it was easy somehow as you showed in your presentation. Yeah, so let's say I try to find always the easiest path so in life. So wherever there's an easy path, I take that path. And uh, in terms of website development, it was always something I liked to do, but I didn't have initially the skills to do that. So I always uh, try to find the easy way. And that easy way was, for example, WordPress was quite straightforward and little functionalities could be added on top. Um, of course, then um, the reason is fun. I, I really like to do these things and see them happen and uh, have like a, a vision of what things could, uh, how they could work and, and for the better, for example, also, as you mentioned, my voting platform. Unfortunately, that one I could not build on top of a existing, uh, let's say, uh, platform like WordPress. I had to write that from scratch. And so there I had to uh, dig as I, I had to sweat a lot because I had to learn how to develop and all that. And uh, at the end, actually, I achieved. I'm really happy with that. It works smoothly. So to answer your question, it's just fun. I do love the platform. I do love the ease of use. And um, and for me, it's it's really really intuitive and and it rewards me like at a personal level. And I will really be happy if this plugin gets used by more people, because then it will mean that it's not Ardo Rocks anymore. It will be available to anyone who has a body press or a forum on um, a BB Press WordPress that they want to instead of giving only rewards in terms of points or badges, they really get a, a, a real asset on the blockchain that they could then trade and transfer, etc. So I, I find the idea very fascinating. This is why yes. I started. You basically build a fully functional gamification framework that you can implement in social media platforms. Yes. Before we go to Alessia's question, just a remark. When we, the COVID crisis started and then the European Union had it, its first voting, televoting. What they did is they printed a paper, ticked the box, made a photo, and sent it by email, and someone counted the emails. And I thought, why they are not? Uh, why are they not using your smart bot? That would be so such a good use case. <laughs> Alessia is asking, what do you think about if you know them, the project Brave and the Bet Token? I actually found it always very interesting. I never fully grasped how the economics of it work. So uh, for me, uh, it was actually one of the initial ideas. So let's say Ardo Rocks is, how to say, a workaround of my original idea. I wanted initially to create an Instagram-like platform where people can post pictures free to use for everyone. So like nowadays, I see it's a very popular uh, platform called Unsplash. So people can download the pictures, use them on their websites or on their uh, wherever they want. And this is free. You can just take them. You don't need to grant rights and all that. And with the same fashion, I was thinking of implementing a bit of Ardo Rock system on a pictures platform. So people could download the people the publishing the pictures will be rewarded because the more likes you receive, the more tokens you receive. And you will create a circle of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say rewarding more people that were publishing good pictures. But unfortunately, that requires a huge uh, effort and development. And therefore, Ardo Rocks was, uh, okay, let me try this out. And then it turned out that it's actually I got very fascinated by the idea of creating a plugin that could be used by many, many, many uh, platforms out there. So uh, it was kind of like, let me do this instead of that. But then I got really uh, involved in it and I, and I, and I really like the, the, the potential. So thank you very much. Again, we have the Q&A section for 
questions that will maybe pop up later. And I would give the microphone to John Larson from RICTIC. RICTIC is an alumni of the Ustargit program in, in Malta from Mita. And I was one of the mentors, but there was not much to mentor for this project. So I just tried to help with some ideas how to use their system to prevent fraud and to show that original products are used. So Nicholas, can you please play the presentation they provided for us? Hi there, my name is John. And my name is Victor. And we're the two co-founders of Richting, which means real or authentic in Swedish. And that's fitting because we're solving the problem of counterfeiting. We've invented an open source protocol and technology which helps combat counterfeiting in a more effective way than anything we've seen before it. On top of this protocol, we are launching a company that aims to be one of many service providers using the same protocol. We will talk very little about our company in this presentation, but rather focus on the benefits of using similar technologies to combat counterfeiting. I will start out by talking a little bit about media and arts and what the current situation of counterfeiting is. And then I'll hand over to my CTO and co-founder, Victor, who's going to tell you more about the technical side of things. Let's start by looking at these two paintings. This is a painting by Norman Rockwell, or well, one of them is, and others are fake. And for ages, only the leftmost picture was known. And it was perplexing to experts on Norman Rockwell because the qualities of the paintings were just a little bit off. The colors were a bit too dull and the creases on the clothing didn't look quite right but nobody could prove that it wasn't a real painting because after all, the owner of the painting was the neighbor of Norman Rockwell himself. So why would it be fake? But later, the actual original was found, the rightmost picture. And had that not been found, nobody would have been the wiser. As it turns out, the neighbor himself was a masterful painter and for unknown reasons decided to make a counterfeit and then hide away the original. In most cases though, Art counterfeits are rarely exact replicas of known originals, but are rather unknown, newly discovered pieces, which makes it very, very hard to prove that they're counterfeits. But it's not only paintings that are being counterfeited, it's practically everything of value. In recent years, Star Wars fans have complained that very, very rare 1970s figurines have started to flood the collector's market. Obviously, all fake. They even reproduce the aging of the paper packaging. The problem with trying to figure out if an art piece is real or not is that it's both complicated and unreliable. The main way that it's done is by looking at the evidence of provenance. That means the records and receipts that can over time show how an art piece has moved. There are two big problems with this though. The first one being that this evidence can be fake too. And the second is, wouldn't you agree that even if you lost the receipt, it's still authentic? And what's even more interesting is that an expert opinion can recertify a piece as original if you go through a costly and complicated process where they look at the details of the specific item. That could be looking at the strokes, the pigment composition, or even the art style to verify whether or not it's real. However, this is equal parts skill and art, so it's not totally reliable. So we figured there has to be a better way to do this. And Victor will now tell you more about how that's done. So wouldn't it be so much easier if all you need to do was to simply tap your phone against an item and an app on your phone would immediately tell you if the item is authentic or not? This is what Rictig is, and it has many application areas even outside of art. The way it works is by utilizing secure RFID tags which are attached to the product or put inside of the product packaging or even inside of the product itself. The RFID tags are special secure RFID tags that utilize secure element technology which means that the RFID tags themselves cannot be copied. The item with an RFID tag is then linked to its issuer on a blockchain in form of a transaction from the issuer to the item's RFID tag. Later, when someone wants to verify that the item is authentic, they simply tap their phone against the item and in the background, an app on their phone checks on the blockchain 
that transaction from the issuer to the item's RFID tag exists, and if it does exist on the blockchain, the item is authentic. Riktig is an open source protocol that finds how parties can issue and verify RFID tags that are attached to products to verify their authenticity. The protocol itself is compatible with any UTXO based blockchain, and we have launched it on the Bitcoin blockchain. All information required to verify an RFID tag are stored either on the tag itself and on the blockchain. That means that verification is not, is not reliant on us as a company and the protocol itself is decentralized as it's not reliant on any central party. The issuers, they hold their own private keys that are required to issue items under their brand. The keys can be used with any service provider they would like we are a service provider that helps them issue items under their brand, but they are free to use whichever one they like. As mentioned earlier, the RFID tags themselves are impossible to copy. This is because they are actually secure element chips and hold a private and public key pair. The private key in them is impossible to extract, but they do, however, expose the public key. And they do have functionality which makes it possible to send a message to the ship that is signed by the private key and later can be verified with the public key. As all of us know, storing data on public blockchains are expensive. And to make the Riktig protocol scalable, what is important is that little data is put on the blockchain. That makes the protocol usable on blockchains like Bitcoin, for example. What we have done is a way that makes it possible to issue up to 4 billion items or item RFID tags with only a single output on the blockchain, which makes it very scalable. So, how does issuance and verification work technically? For this to work, there are three types of data that we need to store on the ships. First of all, it's the public and private key pair. Secondly, there is extra data, and the extra data can be any type of data, such as information about the item, which could be the name of the painting the RFID tag is attached to. And lastly, we also store a Merkle path on the ship. To issue an RFID tag, we create something called an authentication proof, which is done through different steps. First, we concatenate the public key with the extra data. Both are represented as byte arrays, and when we concatenate them, they become a long byte array, which we call the ship data. Secondly, we hash the ship data, and when you hash the ship data, it becomes a hash, which is also a byte array, and this byte array we call the ship hash. All the different ships that we want to issue have different ship hashes. We put together the different ship hashes that we want to issue, and we create a Merkle tree of them. In the top of the Merkle tree, we have the root hash, which we call an issuance group hash. What is important is that a ship hash has something called a Merkle path, which is the different hashes you should hash the ship hash with to generate the issuance group hash. And what is important is that every ship hash or every different ship will have a different Merkle path, but when hashing the ship hash, Together with the Merkle path, every single ship will result in the same issuance group hash. We then insert the Merkle path for the different ships into the ships themselves. The issuance group hash is also a byte array, and what is important is that a byte array can easily be converted 
into a Bitcoin address, which is what we call an issuance group address. So the issuance group address for all these different four ships would, in this case, be this address. Later, a transaction from the manufacturer or the issuer, sorry, uh, which is this address is sent to the issuance group address and uploaded to the blockchain. Once the transaction has successfully been uploaded to the blockchain, the issuer has issued these four ships that can be verified and traced back to the issuer forever. Later, when someone wants to verify that the ship that the issuer issued is authentic, they follow similar steps to the issuer, but with a different outcome. They first of all tap their phone against the ship, and what will happen in the background is that the phone will extract the public and extra data from the ship. It will concatenate them together to become the ship data, and we do the same thing. We hash the ship data, which generates the ship hash, and then we extract the Merkle path from the ship and hash the Merkle path together with the ship hash, which generates the issuance group hash. The issuance group hash is then converted to a Bitcoin address, which is the issuance group address. And this time, instead of uploading a transaction to the blockchain, the phone will check on the blockchain that a transaction from the issuer to the issuance group address exists on the blockchain. And if it does, it's an authentic item. That's pretty much how it works. And if you would like to check exactly how this works technically, please check our technical spe specification on the Riksdig.net website. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening, and we will be happy to answer any questions you have regarding this. Thank you very much. Thank you, John and Victor. So questions, that was quite a technical talk. Um, Maybe I'll start with a question. Your system is based to secure the chips itself on Bitcoin. Do you think there is a possibility that doesn't make sense to combine the actual products with other blockchains so that you secure the identification of the chip itself on Bitcoin, but that you might be able to add additional information regarding the product, like the transport papers or specifications? Can you hear us all right? Can you hear us? Yes, just. Okay, okay great. Perfect. All right. Uh, well, uh, it potentially definitely makes sense in the future, but since we're in quite early stages, we want to make sure that we, at the moment, do what we can do at, at the current time, so to speak. So what we can guarantee at the moment is the link between the issuer and the chip, the product itself. And and in the future, we'll look into different use cases combined with this. But what we know that we can do definitely better than anything we have seen is to authenticate that the item is authentic. And, and uh, an interesting thing to note as well is that the, it's actually quite a few different specifications that we have come up with. So um, the actual way that the, the chips would seek their cryptographic identity and kind of have that as a merged group, that is irregardless of whatever blockchain you use. So whatever rules that you decide to look up uh, is, is uh, separate from that. So you can think of many interesting uh, extensions to this. Francisco is asking if those NFC chips are open source or standard? They, they will be open source. Uh, the, so the chips themselves, uh, it's the same kind of chips that you have in passports, for example, uh, and they are programmable. Uh, so you put software on them, and the software that you put on them uh, will be open source. Any 
Any other questions from the audience? There's one more. Leandro is asking, could be similar to have NFT linked to an NFC chip? For sure. Uh, so I think that the NFT approach is very, very interesting and it obviously uh, enables a lot of cool use cases because you can make a physical, the representation of a physical item interact with other blockchain uh, rules, for example. But so what we want to focus on at first is something that's simpler because obviously a known problem with NFTs are that it's very hard to, I mean, if I transfer the NFT to you, then you cannot also, like, in order for you to, to uh, assert that you also have the physical representation, you have to come after me with a, with a hammer. Um, so that is a problem that we do not try to solve now, but yes, definitely, you, you could definitely do that. One more question, if a question pops up. So then we will continue with our next um, selected keynote. Emania will talk about the project Cryptic Legends. And they are also um, alumni of the You Started program, but one year earlier than uh, Rictix group, so to say. And uh, Nicolas, maybe you can play the video, perfect. Hello from beautiful Dragons. My name is Nemanja and I'm the CEO of Cryptic Legends. Uh, I'll be telling you a bit about uh, my team's experience uh, while designing and developing uh, a game on blockchain, a collectible game on blockchain. Uh, this is my team. I want to tell you just a little bit about uh, the team in order to uh, show you how we actually came to, to merging these two. Uh, so, uh, I started my career designing iOS games. Um, did it for a while without any real commercial success. Uh, then switched to building just regular iOS apps. Um, during which time I discovered uh, board games and uh, meddled with designing the board games a bit. Um, and uh, about a year before starting with Cryptic Legends, I was looking into uh, a way back into the video game industry. With me, it's always been about designing games. Uh, I wasn't really that much interested in, in blockchain. It, uh, it, it appeared at the time as just uh, as, uh, an easy way to, a too easy way to earn some money. My, my co-founders uh, saw the bigger picture and uh, they were actually, at, at the time, they, um, they tried different things with blockchain. They invested a bit, uh, and um, eventually they started actually developing on blockchain. And they had a year round of uh, different hackathons around Europe, uh, so they got some experience. And even before that, they were great engineers, uh, 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 so with, with a lot of experience in simply building all kinds of digital digital stuff. So Dushan and me were working at the same company at the time, uh, his company, uh, and we were looking into building a, 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 a game, a simple game. Uh, and he said, you know, why not look into blockchain? Uh, crypto kitties was already a thing, were already a thing, and uh, uh, there was this Loon Networks uh, uh, thing on Kickstarter, so they had some articles about benefits of that blockchain can bring to the industry. Um, so I looked into it and um, it actually did sound really interesting. Uh, for me, it was kind of merging uh, the tangibility of, of uh, board games, collectible card games um, with the digital world. Um, and a little bit before that, I was, uh, I, I've seen the, this TV show called Toys That Made Us. Uh, so I was hyped about, uh, I, I remembered how when I was little I wanted to make toys. And, uh, and uh, this was almost like that. So, you know, 
I don't have to. I don't need a, a large factory. I don't. Know, I don't need uh, storage facilities. I don't need transportation. Uh, but I. I still basically make the heroes that I make. I. I make them on a on a production line. You know. So. Uh, um, it, 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 it. That was it actually. So it. It became the the main ingredients. You know, like. Uh, uh, okay, action figures. You can. Ha you have them. They look pretty. You can play with them, but. What can you play with them? Uh, and so, you know, we had the the, all, the, the collectible cards uh, uh, thing to the mix. So there's some rules on it. Uh, there's some traits that the hero has, and uh, there's there's a, a piece of the story. There's some theme to it, and your pocket because it all fits in your pocket. Uh, there's a, there's a entire collection of action figures that you can have in your in your pocket. So. Did, it was inspiring. Um, so yeah, the technology doesn't come without its challenges, yeah, especially at the time, and with uh, with, uh, with with the blockchain networks and, and solutions that we were uh, thinking about. So the first thing is uh, everything kind of costs. So you have to pay gas for every transaction, and. Uh, in games, you can't really do that. You know, for every change that happens in the game, for everything that the players do, uh, you need to let them experiment freely. Uh, you need to let them experiment so that they can learn the game and become better in the game. That's the part of the of the whole experience. You, you can't charge a player to shoot some, somebody in the game. Um, so uh, we had this in mind from the start, and it influenced the whole design. From the beginning, so this was uh, the team pitch. I wanted it to be simple, so there's almost no interaction. Uh, the focus is on collecting. You have uh, uh, those uh, two kind of action figures. You pit them against each other, and there's a battle log that you know it's line by line uh, uh, tells you what's what happened. So the first thing I set out to do uh, was to design the hero, right? Um, and in, already in the first draft, uh, I wanted to separate fixed abilities that will be stored on the blockchain. We don't change them ever, so we don't have to pay for gas in order to you know, meddle with them. Uh, and we don't have to. We, we don't bother the player, and it emphasizes the kind of uh, the, the, the tangible kind of part of the of the whole thing. And we have uh, uh, things that you can actually configure on the server. So if you see here. We have these more uh, mind, body, spirit, numerical values. They're always the same. It's like hero is born with them. That's kind of basic stats. Uh, and uh, on the right side, we have uh, these uh, traits, uh, later became talents, uh, that uh, are also stored on the blockchain. So if the hero has that talent, it will always have that talent. And they can have different rarities. And uh, there's, there's some interesting things about it. Uh, but also, that's fixed abilities. And then we have, as you can see here, roles, actually more like a class in RPG games, uh, uh, warrior and hunter here. Uh, so these are configurable uh, parts. They determine what skills uh, the hero can access, uh, 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 what uh, skills this hero has available for use in battle. And uh, the player can choose between these skills uh, in order to configure their hero and to adjust their uh, role in the battle. Um, yeah, and, and then uh, another thing uh, that we already had here was uh, the way we wanted to convey the story to our to our uh, uh, players, and it's also uh, another layer of collectability. Um, so it's nothing really new. It's uh, flavor text, basically, that you have in any board game. Or you know, Dark Souls had a similar way of conveying their story. They had uh, uh, every item had a piece of a, a story, and then that's how you learn about the world. It's same here. Just we, we just kind of structured it a bit more. So every cryptic is a part of a legend that tells a story about uh, about a tribe or a or a hero or a an event that took took place in, in the world. Uh, so 
you gradually learn about it, about the whole world. Uh, uh, every cryptic is uh, kind of an atomic part, so it's it can stand on its own. But when you have multiple cryptics, you have more knowledge simply about that person or that event or uh, simply the world. Uh, and also uh, a cool thing here is that because every cryptic, uh, every this piece of text is um, attached to uh, to to one uh, either item or hero, and it has uh, that has different rarity levels. So uh, you know players will uh, discover the more common ones first. Uh, so you can kind of uh, uh, at least partially count on on this uh, to in order to you know structure the the order in which they discovered the, the whole story. Uh, it's really cool and it's really interesting when you get to actually writing those those pieces of text and the planning for the story. Okay, so so since we uh, uh, decided to separate the the kind of uh, fixed abilities from from uh, configurable ones, uh, blockchain from server, um, we started looking into ways to add uh, more interaction and strategy mechanics. That was that's all also. Uh, one of the most most common feedbacks that we received while uh, talking about the game with what we perceive as our poten potential audience. We still do perceive those people as our potential audience. Um, yeah, lack of interaction. So um, what you can see here is we already uh, it's already a party of heroes. It's no more. It's not not just one hero anymore. Um, here you can see your whole collection. Uh, you can change the formation. It makes difference if it's range or ranged or uh, uh, melee um, position, and then you can configure your hero. So what you can do is you can assign them different items, and uh, you can spend skill points um, based on the level of the hero. You can spend spend an amount of uh, skill points in order to um, assign them skills. So uh, skills with no skill points assigned will not actually be active during the combat. Um, those that are assigned, they have different levels. Uh, so uh, this is something that you can play with, and it will affect uh, the order that the heroes will attack each other. Uh, it will affect um, their health, damage, and there's other cool things that we, that we are uh, have in mind here in order to kind of uh, differentiate between the different roles that, that heroes can have in the in the battle. Next we have progression cost. Another cost, right? Uh, so you've seen uh, 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 the battle and uh, after the battle some heroes uh, you know, they get uh, experience points, they level up. You need those levels in order to have more skill points to assign them to new skills, to unlock new skills and uh, you can't expect a player to pay after every battle, right? So uh, you know, how do you solve this? And our first uh, game loop looked like this, and it's not a, a, a pretty image because uh, if you compare the gaming fun towards the spending of money, it's not really a, a great a great ratio. There's also some gaining money, but we'll talk more about that in in, in the opportunities section, right? So anyway. Uh, uh, the solution to this was similar to the previous one, and that's uh, to separate uh, uh, progression. So we store the hero level on the blockchain, but also on the server. And we only update it when you want to uh, trade your character. So once you sell your character, that's when uh, uh, the level is updated. It's uh, uh, we update if your hero was uh, a level 20, it would cost as if it was level one. Um, so uh, that's very convenient, and it's also kind of seamless because uh, you are paying for the transaction fee. Uh, and the final challenge is onboarding, right? Uh, if you've uh, looked for games, for crypto games, for blockchain games, uh, usually the first thing you encounter when you see press play or, or whatever is this wall of uh, steps and text and 
but there's installing things and there's there's topping up things and there's restarting things and um, it's not a very nice picture and very inviting picture right so what we decided to do with this is um, simply let the players play without the blockchain they don't even have to know what blockchain is that it even exists uh, only when they want to actually trade uh, the heroes uh, you know, use the blockchain actually, uh, that's when we introduce it. And so in that way, we, we wait for them to be additionally motivated to use the blockchain. Uh, so what this did actually is it made our game a free-to-play game, right? Uh, and this allowed us to experiment with, uh, uh, you know, to, to add, introduce other free-to-play mechanics. So what we are doing is uh, uh, we are experimenting with different modes of competition, trying to add a bit more interactivity without, you know, uh, touching the, the automatic uh, type of battle. And then uh, we want to add temporary boosts for those fixed abilities. So uh, right now, so, so what you can do is you can um, upgrade your mind ability, for example, like you, you've been training, and uh, do a temporary boost, and this uh, actually helps us shape the uh, duration and uh, and uh, um, amount of player sessions per day. Um, yeah, and and uh, one other thing also is um, gradual and thematic uh, introduction of those uh, fixed abilities. So uh, you get a hero; they have talents, but they are locked. So you have to uh, kind of fight in events and earn uh, a particular type of uh, some divine origin keys in order to kind of uh, have the play, have the hero discover more about the about their origin and uh, so that they can actually use the the talent in in battle. And then also, you know, we wouldn't be doing this if there weren't opportunities. Uh, although here mostly they, they, they regard the business models, different business models. So aftermarket. So usually in those collectible games, traditional collectible games, uh, you know, if you have, you, you would have two guys with cards and they would want to trade and one would give a card to the other and the other would give money to the first one, right? So uh, that's how transactions work. Where's the developer here? On the side, right? So uh, you can have assets that you've built, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, these assets could be circulating in aftermarkets for years after you've built them, uh, printed them, produced them, you know. And uh, the only cost that you charge is the first one. But blockchain actually allows us to remain a part of these aftermarket uh, uh, transactions because we implement it in the token itself so that we can get a piece of transaction uh, uh, every time, everywhere. And these are, of course, small fees, only a couple of percent, which I think is fair. Another thing that we can do is we can have outside artists uh, contribute with special card series, for example, and, uh, what, uh, uh, and, and they can also... Uh, be a part of this revenue share, right? Uh, uh, for as long as the as their asset is in use, and this doesn't have to be, you know, doesn't have to regard only uh, the artist. It can also work for, uh, let's say, a game designer who, uh, you know, designed the card mechanics uh, or or similar thing. Now something that has more to do with game design, actual game design, right? Uh, so. Uh, I already talked about the fixed part of the hero that is stored on the blockchain. It's stored uh, as a, a non-fungible token, so it's, every hero is unique. Um, and what we do is we have uh, our server part that interprets what is up there, right? So uh, mind, body, and spirit become actually mind, body, and spirit, and our game uh, uh, works out the way how it's used. There's no reason uh, to not not have uh, other games with completely different uh, uh, rules 
and different stories use the same token, right? So uh, what's uh, body in my game and another game can be, uh, I don't know, speed, maybe, you know, or um, mind, uh, better mind can mean better uh, vehicle control and, and uh, things like that. So uh, what we did was we were really uh, careful uh, when we designed the tokens so that they are designed in such a kind of a general way uh, in order to um, be able to accommodate different uh, game genres and uh, different uh, settings. That's all from me. I hope it was uh, interesting. I hope you enjoyed the scenery. Uh, and uh, you know, thank you for, for listening. And I'm here for, for your, any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your talk. Questions, you know the procedure. Don't be shy. Oh, the first one. Mm -hmm. Are you listed in OpenSea already? No, not yet. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if uh, OpenSea um, um i don't think they accept the current network that we are using it's a kind of a still in development uh, network and they are not yet um uh, very uh, they don't have uh, the nfts as developed so we are kind of helping in that uh, it's eternity uh, blockchain a e eternity Next one, what network are you using and why did you choose that particular blockchain? Uh, yeah, so we are using Eternity blockchain. Uh, they have um, uh, some kind of, uh, so I, well, uh, I, I'm not the, the blockchain guy in the team, so forgive me if uh, my ends sound a bit amateurish, um, but um, uh, they have some kind of state channels that allow a part of the uh, whole uh, transaction calculations to be done off the chain which uh, saves a lot of um, kind of uh, ma money or uh, resources uh, so uh, this would allow um, developing kind of um, maybe tournament or uh, some kind of other competition that would have sense to make sense to um, additionally verify and have on blockchain but this would allow us not to have it all and yet maintain the the kind of uh, reliability of the blockchain that was one of the things are you planning offline activities and material tokens some other blockchain based games are experimenting with it not to mention the whole collectible scene yeah, so we, we had some some similar things in mind, but for uh, just pro for promotion promotional uh, purposes, not for the kind of a part of the game uh, uh, thing. So if there are no further questions then we are actually earlier than expected mm -hmm. so we have a 15 minutes break and we meet five past but there's another question in the q and a you're planning to make the assets interoperable to in other games exactly yeah so the idea is well actually what what we want to make interoperable is the heroes first and foremost uh, so uh, the idea is because the heroes are Defined in a, in a general way with their attributes, so that uh, what is a, a hero or let's say a barbarian in one game, in another game it can be a goalkeeper, for example, because you know it's he's tall and he's uh, uh, he has kind of his has good reflexes, perfect for a goalkeeper. So uh, the idea is at one point to make it like that and maybe make maybe have a, a kind of a uh, inter-game uh, asset store where 
UI things for your game without even having to know how they look or what they do in another game that somebody else is paying and selling uh, the asset. Great, thanks. So perfect. Yes. See everyone in 15 minutes, but please do not close Zoom at the moment because it seems that Zoom has some issues with people leaving the conference who want to re-enter. So for the 15 minutes break, just please leave the app open. And we are, because Ernst, our next speaker, is doing his talk live and he can also not enter the conference at the moment, but we hope that we solve this issue in the next 15 minutes and we see each other again here. Thank you. Bye everyone.